we start the discussion of method of characteristics for quasilinear equations from this lecture onwards. The outline for uh, today's lecture is uh, first we recall the assumptions and notations which are used in the context of quasilinear equations and we emphasize the importance of mathematical precision, we see a couple of statements which could uh, wrongly uh, imply uh, wrong things, okay? which, uh, uh, which are written in language and that can be read in many ways. So therefore, uh, this highlights the importance of writing or importance of understanding mathematically what we write in language. And then we take first steps into method of characteristics for uh, quasilinear equations. First we uh, present the inspiration behind this method and uh, we carry out the step 1 out of uh, the 3 steps. So in the next lectures step 2 and step 3 will be discussed. So assumptions and notations used in the context of quasilinear equations. Recall from lectures 2.1 and 2.5 quasilinear equation we denote by QL and that is an equation axyu ux plus bxyu uy equal to cxyu where a, b, c are assumed to be c1 functions defined on omega 3. Needless to say omega 3 is an open subset of R3 and connected uh, we already discussed whether we should have the connectedness or not. Uh, this is the most important thing we do not want the coefficients of the partial derivatives ux and uy namely a and b vanish simultaneously at the same point. So therefore, we require that at least one of the a and b must be non-zero at each and every point in omega 3. And the projection of omega 3 to xy plane is denoted by omega 2. Omega 2 is those elements of R2 such that xyz belongs to omega 3 for some z in R. Now Cauchy problem, uh, given a space curve gamma described parametrically by gamma x equal to fs, y equal to gs and z equal to hs, s belongs to i, where i is an interval and fgh are c1 functions defined on the interval i and such that f dash s square plus g dash s square is not equal to 0 for all s in i. This we discussed that this corresponds to the projection gamma 2 x equal to f s and y equal to g s. This is a curve in a plane and this curve is what is called regular. This is uh, this assumption is something to do with the smoothness of the curve gamma 2. This means the tangent is well defined and each and every point of uh, gamma 2. For example, this is gamma 2 and you take a point, the point looks like fs, gs and at this point the tangent line, uh, this is not a good picture, we will just write a good place. This point, this has the direction of f prime s g prime s. Find a solution to the quasilinear equation such that u of f s g s equal to h s. That means on the curve gamma 2 where f s g s describes a typical point on gamma 2, when you take u of that then you will get into 3 dimensions z equal to that z is going to be h of s that means it is lying on the surface z equal to u of x y and this we require for s belonging to a sub interval of y. So it means that a part of the curve gamma lies on the surface. In other words we are looking to construct a surface, construct an integral surface which contains a part of the curve gamma. So what we are going to see in the future lectures is that if you are given this curve gamma, this is in R3 and given any point on that, that looks like fs naught, gs naught, hs naught under some conditions we are going to show that let us call this point p naught, some conditions we are going to show that there is a surf integral surface yes z equal to uxy such that it contains this point p0 on some curve nearby that, some gamma, the initial data, in datum curve gamma 
is contained on that surface. Of course, we need some assumptions to assert that there is such a function u. We have already seen that uh, this question arose already in the case of linear and semilinear equations when we try to solve Cauchy problems. Some assumptions need to be made and then we will show such a function exists. This will be the final result at the end of implementing step 3 of the method of characteristics. Now, a uh, few points about importance of mathematical precision. Before that, let us state this theorem. This theorem we proved in the last lecture, lecture 2.5. So, this said that given a function u defined on a domain d in omega 2, which is a C1 function and S denotes this surface z equal to uxy, that is the graph of this function in R3, then saying that this S is an integral surface is same as saying that S is a union of characteristic curves for quasilinear equations. This is what we discussed in lecture 2.5, we proved this theorem. Now, a remark about this theorem. Theorem is of great help in the search for a solution to quasilinear equations, namely the Cauchy problem for quasilinear equation, Cp for uh, quasilinear equations. The assertion 2 implies 1. What is 2? 2 says the surface S yes, is a union of characteristic curves. That implies that, su that surface S yes, is an integral surface. Of course, here u is in the background which is fixed in the background. So, the assertion 2 implies 1 suggests that an integral surface if exists, in other words a surface z equal to uxy where your solution if exists may be constructed as a union of characteristic all characteristic curves. However, theorem does not assert that the geometric object which is formed as a union of all characteristic curves is necessarily a surface. In other words, if you take union of characteristic curves, it is not necessary that the third component is expressible as a function of first two coordinates, it does not say that. The theorem says you give me a function u and look at the graph of u. Now, it is a comment about the graph of u. The graph of u is a surface, it is s it denoted by s. s is an integral surface if and only if it is union of characteristic curves that u has to be brought beginning. So, therefore, 2 in plus 1 suggests that an integral surface may be constructed. It does not assert that geometric object which is formed as a union of characteristic curves is necessarily surface. That means, there is a u hidden behind that such that the third component is a u of the first two components x, y. And moreover, even if it is surface, it is not clear whether it is going to be an integral surface. So, here surface means z equal to u x, y for some function u, that is what we mean in, bo in both of this. Now, mathematical analysis takes over in deciding whether the geometrically constructed surface is an integral surface or not. So, we will come across this analysis uh, in a future lectures, uh, maybe in the next one. Important thing is this precision, mathematical precision is very important. So, I call this mind the language. So, mathematical statements when put in plain English sentences or any other language sentences could lead to imprecise expressions which could be misunderstood. The statement if two integral surfaces intersect at a point, if two integral surfaces intersect at a point, then they intersect along the entire characteristic curve through P. This is a statement. It is a classic case of such a sentence. What does this sentence say? Suppose you have two integral surfaces, they intersect at a point P, then they intersect along the entire characteristic curve through P. What do you mean by entire characteristic curve through P? The longest possible characteristic curve? Uh, passing through the point P, what is it? So, a corrected formulation of the sentence is stated in the following corollary and it follows immediately from theorem. What is the corollary? Let S1 and S2 be two integral surfaces for quasilinear equation QL such that their intersection is non empty. Of course, that is not a big deal because here we are saying it intersects at a point P, therefore, uh, we have not made uh, much difference. The sentence is as it is non empty. 
let p be a point in the intersection. So, that takes care of the first condition, the conditional statement. If two integral surfaces intersect at a point p, that is captured in 1 and 2. Now, we have to see how we are capturing the conclusion, they intersect along the entire characteristic curve. Then some part of the characteristic curve passing through p lies on both s1 and s2. So, we can only say some part near p, alright, there is a big characteristic curve uh, passing through p, but entire curve why will it be there and both of them? Some part is there, that is reasonable to believe and that is what is true. Now, second point. Another example of a misleading statement that is widely in use is intersection of two integral surfaces is a characteristic curve. Because we believe that if two surfaces intersect, imagine two planes intersect, it is a line. Is that true always? If two intersection of two planes is not a line always, it could be a plane, it could be the same plane, right? It need not be a line all the time. So, that is in fact happens which is a counter example to the statement. So, we have to be careful. The next example illustrates that intersection of two distinct integral surfaces is not necessarily a curve, forget about characteristic curve. Any curve on the intersection need not be a characteristic curve, even that is true. That is simply because the example we are going to see the two integral surfaces intersect and give a surface. Note however, that through every point of intersection, there passes a characteristic curve which lies on both integral surfaces. So, a corrected formulation of the original sentence is stated as next corollary. So, intersection of two integral surfaces is a characteristic curve, this is not precise, it is not correct as we under, usually understand this. The standard meaning of this uh, turns out to be that this statement is incorrect. So, corrected formulation we are going to give, before that let us do this example. Suppose u is a solution to QL defined on D, then so is another function V defined on D1. Now, how do I define this V? It is going to be using u, therefore, D1 I will take it to be a subset of D. It is a proper subset of D, okay. Of course, V remains solution to the QL. And look at the integral surfaces, yes, you are right to denote that this surface is defined using the function u, this is used, this func this sv, this surface z equal to vxy is defined using the function v. They are different because domains of the functions u and v are different, okay. It is true that sv is a subset of su, but they are different. Two functions are different the moment their domains are different. So, but intersection of su and sv is sv which is an integral surface. So, it is not a curve, it is an integral surface. Through every point of SV, we can find a curve which is not a characteristic curve and another that is a characteristic curve. This will not be the case if the two integral surfaces intersect without touching and that is what is the content of the next corollary. So, when is the intersection of two planes is a straight line? When they do not match, right? Some the two planes, it is not a line if and only if they are the same planes. For a surface, uh, the planar approximation will be the tangent plane. So, if we say that uh, tangent planes are not same, then it will be a curve. That is what is the next corollary. So, two surfaces in R3 are set to touch each other if at each of the points which are common, that means wherever intersection, whichever point is in the intersection of the two surfaces, at those points the tangent planes are the same. So, our theorem is going to be for surfaces which do not touch each other. If two integral surfaces intersect without touching each other and the intersection is a curve, then it is a characteristic curve. This is the correct uh, corollary. Okay. <coughs> if, uh, if they touch each other, it is like uh, tangent planes are one and the same. Whenever planes are same, uh, we got the intersection to be plane, right, for planes. So, here we do not expect a straight line there for planes. Therefore, same thing here, uh, here two surfaces if they intersect uh, by touching each other, then we are not making any statement. But if they do not touch either, each other and intersect, that means points are in common, then the intersection if it is a curve, so which means it may not be curve as well, it can be a point, uh, is a curve, then gamma is a characteristic curve. 
So to prove that gamma is a characteristic curve what we need to do? We have to prove that the tangential direction at any point on the curve is the characteristic direction. Let us prove that. So the tangential direction to gamma at P belongs to the tangent plane to both the surfaces S1 and S2 at that point P as gamma is lying on both of them. If the direction of the tangent is not along the characteristic direction, then it follows that the direction of the tangent to gamma at P and the characteristic direction AP, BP, CP, they form a linearly independent set in a two dimensional tangent space. This implies that both the tangent spaces are the same. All the directions in the tangent planes for both S1 and S2 at the point P are the same. And hence tangent planes coincide which means they touch each other. Therefore, we have assumed they do not touch each other. Therefore, this contradiction proves that the tangent to gamma at P is not independent of characteristic direction, it is proportional, it is linearly dependent, so proportional to the characteristic direction at P, which means it has a character, the curve gamma has characteristic direction at P and P is arbitrary point, that means the curve is a characteristic curve. Now, in the proof we have not used the theorem, therefore uh, why do we use the word corollary? So therefore, uh, this question arises, terming it as a corollary is acceptable as one can prove corollary using theorem. You can use the theorem and prove the corollary that is left as an exercise to you. We have seen one proof, other proof uses theorem directly the statement of theorem and that is left as an exercise. Now the question is do integral surfaces as in the corollary exist that is two integral surfaces which uh, intersect but do not touch each other whether such surfaces exist. Yeah, corollary is concerned with the two integral surfaces which, which intersect without touching, having a curve in common and corollary asserts that such a curve is necessarily a characteristic curve for quadrilinear equation. We come across such integral surfaces when a Cauchy problem has more than one solution. Look at this example ux equal to u. Okay, this equation uh, we are always considering partial differential equations in two independent variables unless otherwise stated. So, this is a function of two variables x and y and the equation is ux equal to u. So, this is like a ODE in the x variable and we are given initial condition ux0 equal to e power x. If you want Cauchy data, what is it? x equal to s, y equal to 0, z equal to e power s, s belongs to r. This problem has infinitely many solutions, we saw this already. There are the form u, u of x y equal to e power x into t y where t is a c1 function t of 0 should be 1. Therefore, as many c1 functions as you have with the property t0 equal to 1 you have so many solutions clearly infinitely many. Now consider two integral surfaces z equal to u x y and z equal to u tilde of x y two integral surfaces defined by this formulae one is e power x plus y other one is e power x minus y both are solutions to this Cauchy problem. The two integral surfaces intersect all along the datum curve that is S0 e power s that is intersection. In figure on the next slide the surface S corresponding to u e power x plus y is depicted in black, the one for S tilde is depicted in blue and datum curve is in red color here. So, 3D picture. Okay, so, intersection is shown uh, here that is the datum curve, blue is one integral surface, the other one is another integral surface. Yeah, in getting these integral surfaces, how did I get this example? We use the idea that if two integral surfaces touch each other, what happens? The tangent planes are same, the directions in the tangent planes are same and ux, uy minus 1 for both integral surfaces would be the same because tangent plane is same normal has to be same plus or minus. Okay. 
uh, we are not insisting that uh, normal has unit length etc. So therefore, a direction is direction, any other normal will be a proportional to this, they will be same. So in these examples, we made sure that normals are not the same, therefore tangent planes will not be the same. That was, that was what was done and uh, please do a few more examples of pairs of integral surfaces as above. Okay, now let us discuss method of characteristics for quasilinear equations. First we start with an inspiration for this method. What inspired this method? Of course, it is no secret because we just saw one theorem at the beginning of today's lecture and even in lecture 2.5 that is the inspiration. Integral surface as a union of characteristic curves that is the idea. So, this is the theorem. Okay. This is inspiration, it is not saying that you construct a union of characteristic curves that is automatically an integral surface, it does not say that. It still requires you that the surface is given by z equal to uxy. We still have to do some work, but inspiration it works. So, <coughs> in this example uh, ux equal to 0, uxy equal to sin y and integral surface is blue and that can be obtained as union of these black lines. And this um, magenta is the datum curve that is 0 y sin y, 0 s sin s, okay. this is that one. So, the method relies on using characteristic curves associated to quasilinear equations to find a solution to Cauchy problem. It believes that this implication 2 in place 1 yields a solution from characteristic curves. It believes that okay, let us take the union of characteristic curves, somehow we can get uh, that function u and it will be all right. That is what the method believes. In the figure on the last slide, the curve in magenta is a datum curve, characteristic curves passing through points of gamma are in black and we saw that uh, the blue thing is a union of black lines. The integral surface may be obtained as a union of all characteristic curves passing through points of gamma. So, it is working in that example. Of course, another point that we knew the answer beforehand the function, but inspiration is fine. So, what are the main steps? First step uh, passing characteristic curves through points of gamma. This is a strategy we tried for linear and uh, semi linear equations in the last lecture. Okay. Defining a candidate solution u using inverse function theorem, this is a key step. Step 3 is establishing that the, the function u defined in step 2 is actually a solution to the Cauchy problem. Question, yeah you have given 3 steps, can we always implement those 3 steps successfully that is a question. Step 1 is okay. What is the step 1? It is to pass characteristic curves through points of gamma. That is the step 1, passing characteristic curves through points of gamma. That is okay. Because A, B, C are C1 functions in omega 3, Picard's theorem will give you uh, that characteristics pass through every point of gamma. Second step, this is where we encounter difficulty, this is where the problem lies because we need to apply inverse function theorem, inverse function theorem requires some uh, conditions to be met. So, we will be forced to impose compatibility conditions between the PDE and gamma. Even then the integral surface may not contain entire gamma or a solution may not be defined on whole of omega 2. These are the two things we somehow want. I want a Cauchy problem so that the integral surface contains the entire datum curve which is given to me and it is defined on the whole of omega 2, omega 2 being the projection of omega 3. So, this is desirable, but neither of these two may happen. We will see using examples. Step 3 is a cakewalk, one step 2 is carried out. Let us discuss step 1, passing characteristic curves through points of gamma. 
finding an integral surface containing the datum curl, now we have decided a piece of datum curl means what does that mean? We need to weave a surface around gamma, gamma is given to us and we need to find a surface something like that a surface yes. such that the resulting surface is an integral surface for the equation. A surface could be woven around gamma by actually take a point of gamma take a characteristic through that through that through that okay, like that. Repeat this at every point of gamma. by passing curves through each point of gamma. Further, if these curves are characteristic curves for QL, then the surface is expected to turn out to be an integral surface. You have to be very careful, I use the word expected, usually people mean expected means it will happen. No, this may not happen, hoped, maybe that is the correct word, then the surface is hoped to be, turn out to be an integral surface by the theorem. So, weaving an integral surface, yeah, this is a computer generated picture of what I have just written. So, this is the datum curve and you pass characteristic curves through the each point and then hopefully you will get a surface and that surface is expressed like z equal to uxy and u is a solution to the Cauchy, uh, to the PDE. It will be a solution uh, to the Cauchy problem in the sense Cauchy data will be satisfied that is how you are getting the solution. Okay. How do we implement the step 1? Take a point P on the datum curve. It looks like F s G s H s for some s in i. The characteristic curve through P is the image or trace of solutions to characteristic ODEs. This is the system of characteristic ODEs dx by dt equal to a, d by dt equal to b, dz by dt equal to c. What are ABC? ABC are in QL. What is QL? a u x plus b u y equal to c. Satisfying the initial conditions, I need the solutions of this ODEs to pass through this point. So, at t equal to 0, x of 0 is f s, y of 0 is g s, z of 0 equal to h s. By Cauchy Lipschitz Picard theorem, we are assuming a, b, c are c 1 function, they are local ellipses, i v p will have a unique solution. Let the solution be represented by this notation x equal to capital X of T s, y equal to capital Y of T s, z equal to capital Z of T s. Of course, uh, ODEs were in the variable T, then why are we writing S here? It is because the characteristic ODE we have solved using initial conditions which depend on S. The initial conditions depend on S. To remember that we write X of T s, Y of T s, Z of T s. So, it is defined for T belonging to some interval. Now you see js, the interval may change from s to s, for some s it may be one interval, for another s it may be a different interval. Only thing that we can assure is that 0 belongs to js. Now re recall a lemma that we did on reparameterization of characteristic curves. We may take js equal to r according to that lemma. The reason being, let me recall the reason, the system of characteristic ODE is a system of autonomous equations and for that if you are looking only at the trajectories, you can always change change the independent variable that is namely t there to make that the interval js is actually equal to r. Trace will be the same. Now remaining steps in the method of characteristics will be carried out in uh, lecture 2.7, the next lecture. Let us summarize what we did. We understood that mathematical statement should be written with as much precision as possible, full precision. Okay. In mathematical statement, it has to be fully precise and everyone should understand the same meaning of the sentence. We should clearly write or understand the mathematical meaning of statements made in non-mathematical languages. Using the connection between integral surface and characteristic curves, we hope to solve Cauchy problems for quasilinear equations 
To achieve this goal we proposed three steps out of which the first step was carried out successfully. Thank you.